and uh, you know really looking forward to this hour long session. Steve, of course, has a wealth of experience both in academia and the industry uh, on this topic of technology commercialization. And it's a very rich topic, and uh, he's going to share with us his experiences, uh, you know, uh, during this hour. Uh, thank you very much. And right at the beginning, before uh, we move uh, on to Steve, you know, we are collecting some data uh, on the participants. So we're going to show you uh, a set of uh, four questions at the beginning. Uh, and we're going to show you each question for about 30 seconds. So if you please would take uh, 30 seconds to answer each of these questions, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. And we'll show these questions at the end as well, the same questions. You know, we, we just, uh, you know, NHLBI and CAI are very data driven and uh, this data would be very useful. So let's take a minute. This is the first question in front of you. Ten more seconds before we move to the next question. Okay, I hope you had a chance to answer that. Now let's move to the second question in the poll. Could you please pose the second question? Yes. Ten more seconds. Okay, let's go to the third question. Ten more seconds. And then finally the fourth question. Ten more seconds. Okay, so I hope you had a chance to answer these questions. And just a couple of more comments before I bring on Steve here. So one is because of the large number of participants, we want everybody to be on mute. And uh, you're already being muted by the organizer. However, we would like you to ask questions. And the way we'd like you to ask questions is by clicking that question box. So there is a, there is a box that says question. There is a plus there. Uh, click on it, and then you'll be able to pose a question to us. And I will be scanning these questions continuously. If a question is more of a clarification question, I'll pose it to Steve right away, and we'll get an answer. If it's more of a discussion question, we'll collect them together and pose them near the end of the session. And if we run out of time, We'll try to get an answer to you by email. Hopefully, we have your email address. Okay, let's turn on to Steve right now. Thanks, Steve, for joining us. And let's move to the next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> thanks, Vish. Uh, this is Steve Flame. Um, let me just give you a, a couple of uh, minutes about my background, just so that we can set the stage here. So, I'm a cardiovascular physiologist by training. I got my degree at UC Davis. Um, I spent the first 10 years of my life in academic uh, uh, university setting in medicine and physiology at Penn State uh, University School of Medicine. I left uh, academia and went to pharmaceutical, large pharmaceutical company on the East Coast, J&J, &J, and then Squibb. And then in 1990, I came to San Diego to engage with earlier stage companies 
uh, here in San Diego and then up in the Bay Area. I'm, in a, I'm an advisor at the Von Liebig Center here at UCSD, which is the Entrepreneurism Center based in the School of Engineering. I'm also an investor, uh, member, and former chairman of the Board of Governors at Tech Coast Angels, which is the largest organized angel group in the country. I'm also an entrepreneur in that I'm uh, leading the startup for a couple of small companies uh, based here in San Diego. And finally, I'm an advisor to the Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. OTAC is the office that was responsible for the funding opportunity announcement that led to the, National, the NIH Centers for Accelerated Innovation, NCAI. And you can see at the bottom of the slide the uh, website that you can go to to learn more about uh, OTAC and what we're doing uh, in that uh, organization. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Next slide. OK, thank you. So for today, I basically have four topics that we're going to address. Um, the first is we're going to talk about uh, assessing the readiness of a technology for, uh, for entry into, the, into a center. Uh, secondly, we're going to talk about how technologies are picked uh, for uh, uh, with the correct level for, of readiness for, for uh, admission to the center. Thirdly, I'm going to talk a little bit about important interactions that are uh, that you should be aware of uh, in in moving your technology through through the center and, and even prior to applying to the center. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the license, uh, the issue of whether or not to license a tech, your technology, or whether you as a as the innovator would want to form a startup company that would then uh, license the technology and, and move forward that way. So if we can move to the next slide. So let's talk first about assessing technology readiness. So in general, we have some criteria uh, that, we're, that we look for. Uh, the technology needs to be novel. It really needs to be protectable in that there needs to be some kind of intellectual property protection that would allow it to be commercially uh, recognizable, if you will. Uh, we like to see a good team around the technology that can uh, bring various aspects to it, including the commercial and business side, as well as the technology, obviously. Uh, fourthly, the technology needs to be addressing an attractive market. Uh, an attractive market is something that would uh, bring a partner or an investor to the table to, to uh, invest in the technology so it can move forward. Technologies that uh, enter into the center are uh, going to be given a maximum of $200,000 uh, of federal money, and then the centers themselves can augment this as, as they see fit with additional funding. Um, the technology will reside in the center for a maximum of two years. And at the end of that two-year period, the technology will exit from the center. And that's a requirement. Can we go to the next slide? So what is the definition of an exit from the center at two years? So there are really four ways a technology can exit. The first is that it is licensed to an existing commercial entity, a company out there that wants to develop the technology. Secondly, it, it is licensed to a, a startup company that is formed specifically to commercialize that technology. Some, many times it's, uh, that, that startup is formed by the innovators. Thirdly, the technology is able to attract additional support of some type, either from the institution or from uh, others uh, who are interested in, in supporting it. Uh, that would allow it, say, for example, to go more uh, for, further forward into clinical trial testing. And lastly, if the technology doesn't meet any of those three uh, opportunities, then it, it is returned to the institution uh, as, and they can deal with it as they see fit. Next slide. So in, in terms of how we assess the readiness of a technology, I'm going to talk about it in three different, uh, three different ways. The first way is to actually talk about the status of the technology itself. And what I've listed here is a series of bullets from top to bottom that represents the degree of maturity of a, any given technology. The top one is the lowest, has the lowest level of maturity, and the bottom has the highest level of maturity. So if a technology is actually, uh, if, if the scientists are doing hypothesis testing in a general area, that's a very low level of maturity. If, if you're doing basic research on a given effect, that's a little more mature, but it's still pretty immature. Um, 
the, the next level is looking at the basic effect and observing or, or confirming uh, that the basic effect actually exists. And you're doing that kind of work in vitro or in vivo. Next is that you are actually in preclinical proof of concept testing uh, or, or you've already completed that testing. Next is that you're now engaged in general safety assessment of the technology or you've completed that. Next is that you're actually now doing uh, IND or IDE enabling studies and these are either underway or completed. Then the next level is that you're actually initiated clinical trial testing and finally you are actually showing benefit or, and or safety in a clinical trial uh, situation. Next slide. The second uh, way we like to assess uh, the maturity of, of, a, of an opportunity is looking at the intellectual property status of that technology. So again, low to high, top to bottom, uh, a technology that's already been presented in a scientific meeting as an abstract or a poster or it's been published in a, uh, in a, in a journal of some sort, in other words, it's been disclosed publicly, that is a very low level of maturity from an intellectual property status. Next level is that there is an IP plan that's being established or already established, but again, there has been no prior public disclosure of the technology in meetings or journals or, or abstracts. Next level is that uh, you've gone and filed a disclosure with your local tech transfer office. Next is that there is a provisional patent that's been created and possibly filed already in the U.S. Next level would be uh, the conduct of an informal freedom to operate assessment on the technology is either underway or being completed. Next is that you've actually filed uh, patents in the U.S. Next level is that you filed or you're in the process of filing international patents uh, with uh, in ex-U.S. countries like Europe, Japan, etc. Next level is that you've completed a formal uh, freedom to operate assessment for the technology. Uh, next level is that your U.S. patents have actually been issued or, or published. And finally, your, your international patent activity has been issued or published. Next slide. So the third area that we look at in terms of technology maturity is the commercial status of the project. Again, low to high. Um, we start with the, a solution looking for a problem. So from a commercial status, that's a very low level of maturity. Second level is there is multiple potential applications for a technology that have been defined, but we haven't really figured out where we're going to go with that technology. Next level is that you know you have a platform technology uh, that has potential for multiple applications, but you're not really sure uh, where you're going with that. Next is target applications are being discussed. The next is that your first commercial application is, is defined and you know the direction you're going to go in. Next is that you actually have customer traction uh, with respect to that commercial application. You've got people out there who know about your technology. They've tested it in some way. They want it. That's called customer traction. Next level is that you're conducted or you're in the process of conducting competitive landscape analysis to define who the competitors are going to be once you actually get to a commercial stage with the technology. Next level is that you're in the process of developing a go-to-market plan for how you're going to deliver the product to the market. Next is that you're in the process of writing a business plan. You're developing that and you're going to cre you're creating a business plan for, uh, for, the, for the technology. Next level is that you've actually got investors or licensors that are uh, in, uh, doing, working on negotiating a term sheet uh, and are interested in taking out the technology. And the last is that potentially you're forming a startup which uh, is designed to acquire the technology from the institution and then you're going to take it forward. Next slide. So now let's talk about how technologies are selected for uh, enter, entrance into a center. So again, we're going to go back through these three different types of uh, status assessments and we're going to talk about which ones work and which ones don't. So from a technology status perspective, um, 
the if you're at the level first two levels hypothesis testing only or basically doing research on on the on the effect those are really too early for entrance into the center it's remember it's going to take two years uh, you're going to have two years to sort of exit and hopefully you're going to exit into uh, a license or a startup and that is the ideal exit or you're going to go off in another direction with respect to clinical testing I've only put one strike through for the line basic effect observed or confirmed in vitro or in vivo. And the reason I did that is that that is a little bit of a gray area. It depends on the technology in the center. In some cases, a technology that's at that level could be uh, actually entered, uh, brought into the center and might actually be able to exit successfully within two years. Generally speaking, that doesn't work very well, but sometimes it might. So it's a little bit of a question mark at this point in terms of levels. And then the other levels that are listed here, uh, technologies that are at those levels um, are clearly ones that uh, would, be, would be qualified to come into the center. Next slide. So now, um, back, we're going to have to back up one. There we go. So now um, the next thing I want to talk about is the intellectual property status of the technology. And you can see I've double uh, struck, struck out only one line here. That is uh, technologies pre presented or are published. If you have disclosed the technology publicly prior to it getting involved in an intellectual property plan uh, with your tech transfer office, you've already uh, essentially eliminated the commercial opportunity for the technology, and it really doesn't qualify for, for the center's program. If you've not done that and you've begun your IP plan and you've still not published and so forth, uh, you qualify, and any of the other stages that are listed here also would allow the technology to qualify for entrance into the center. Next slide. And so now let's talk a little bit about the commercial status, uh, degree of maturity. So with respect to the commercial status, if it's a, if it's a solution looking for a problem, uh, it really doesn't qualify for entrance into the center. Uh, it's going to take too long. You, aren't, you won't be able to be successful in two years. If, you're at, if you know you have multiple potential applications or you have a platform technology with multiple applications, generally those are too early, uh, but potentially they might be acceptable, again, depending upon the center and the specific situation. If you're at a stage where you have target applications being discussed or further in, along down the list, those uh, commercial uh, levels are definitely uh, accept, acceptable into the center until you get down to the bottom two bullets here. And those are the ones where you're already engaged in, uh, in, in, in working with an investor or a licensor in creating a term sheet, or you're already forming a startup to acquire the technology from the institution. Those do not qualify simply because you've already achieved the goal of the center program, and you shouldn't be applying to the center for funding. Next slide. So, what I'd like to do for a minute is just talk about the uh, what we what we see as as an, uh, one of the issues about eligible products, and we like to see what an an ideal team be involved in in these uh, projects, even at an earlier early stage before you even start uh, worrying about commercial activity. And so, the the ideal team is going to be composed of a technology lead, a commercial business lead, a mentor advisor. Uh, individual and your tech transfer officer. The technology lead could be the professor, faculty member, postdoctoral fellow, or it could be a graduate student or an undergraduate student. Uh, make, understand that I'm not talking about the principal investigator. I'm talking about the technology lead, the person that's going to drive the technology development. The commercial or business lead, uh, ideally we like to see somebody engaged with the team that brings uh, an, ex an experienced entrepreneur's view on how to develop a technology. This can be, for example, a, uh, an executive MBA student that's participating in, in an MBA program at your local business school. Um, we, again, we want to see, we, ought, we like to see an, a mentor, advisor, potential investor engaged with the team uh, pretty early. And obviously, your tech transfer officer needs to be part of this story as well. Next slide. So now let's focus on important interactions that you as a uh, sort of a lead with respect to the technology need, need to think about. The first one I want to talk about is your campus tech transfer office, or TTO. And so what we recommend is that you uh, 
you, establish, you go and meet your tech transfer officer as soon as possible and establish a rapport. This person is going to be on your team and you need for them to be your partner during this process. The next thing you need to do is you need to learn how from them to create and file a disclosure so that you can initiate the, tech, uh, the intellectual property status and protect the technology. You, your disclosure needs to be filed before you present the technology uh, or publish it, and your tech transfer officer will guide you through that process. You should work with your tech transfer officer very closely to set, uh, and they'll ask you to help them set patent claims and the scope of the applications of the technology. And you should also engage in, in a discussion with them, and they're probably going to do that with you, to talk about what the valuation of the technology could be. And I just want to point out the fact that the, uh, the licensor, um, the, the, the owner of the technology is going to want the valuation of that technology to be as high as possible, and the licensor of the technology is going to want that valuation to be as low as possible. So there's going to be a dynamic negotiation there. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Next slide. So in terms of that point, um, we need to understand who actually owns the technology. Um, so in most cases, uh, if you're faculty, staff, postdoc, or graduate student, somebody that's actually paid uh, to do the work uh, by the institution, um, you're probably, uh, the technology is probably owned by the institution. If you're an undergraduate student, and I've seen a number of cases where an undergraduate student comes up with a great idea that's patentable. Understand that undergraduate students are not employees of the institution, and so in many cases, part of or maybe even all of the intellectual property around that technology is owned by the student, not by the institution. Um, again, about technology valuation, the highest valuation will be sought by the owner, so it could be the institution, and the lowest valuation will be sought by the licensor, which would be the company or, or, or a startup. And so I just point this out that if you're going to do a, a startup that's focused on licensing this particular technology, you are the licensor and you have a sort of a dynamic negotiation there that you have to deal with uh, with respect to trans tech transfer. So next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about interactions with a commercial business lead, if you will. Um, I, I want to make the point that defining the technology is really only half the battle. This is something that I've learned over many years of struggling with both technology and then the commercial side. In my opinion, a lot of the work is yet to be done, and it's, a lot of it is on the marketing commercial business side. Um, realize that most innovator technologists really don't have the business skills to lead a startup and to be the uh, bring the sort of business uh, commercial uh, aspects to the team. They don't know about competitive landscape, target market, customer base, go to market strategy, or overall business plan preparation. And the other next point I want to just make is that investors generally tend to avoid investing in early stage projects that are led by technologists. They like to see an experienced business person in the mix. So my advice is to try to engage early with a commercial or business lead. If you can do this uh, and get their help even before you apply to the center's program, you're going to be better off with respect to being successful there. Next slide. Uh, another important interaction is the mentor, advisor, potential investor person. So this person uh, is going to be, many times, is an experienced, maybe retired executive, uh, somebody that's been successful, they've done this before, um, maybe they're in a mode now where they don't, they have more time on their hands than they know what to do with, and they're interested in uh, paying back a little bit to, for their successes, uh, looking for a way to engage and stay active. And in many cases, these are early stage investors uh, and that are particularly focused on university technologies. If you can find somebody like that to get involved in the team, uh, they're very helpful in, in, in guiding you, figuring out how to form the team. Uh, they become a team advisor. Uh, they can bring to the table extensive support and investor networking in your local community. 
and I, my advice is to engage with somebody like this on the team as early as possible. Next slide. Now I'm going to turn to the, I think it's the last topic on the list of the agenda, and that is whether the question of whether or not you should support the technology being licensed to an existing company, or should you decide to form a startup on your own and then bring the technology forward within the startup. So there's some important points to consider. Uh, remember that in most cases the institution is going to own the technology, the IP, they're going to own that, and they're going to want to license it. Um, you are part of the institution uh, as long as you're still working for the institution. And so the institution is going to seek your help uh, in setting the value of the IP, determining the fields of application, and defining the patent claims. Next slide. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the role of a scientist uh, innovator in the formation and, and running of a startup. Uh, and so part of the question here is whether or not you, the academic scientist, want to maintain your academic status. Um, if you do want to continue to be faculty in the university, and we certainly would like to see as many people do that as possible, uh, you probably are not going to be able to be a company employee or, a co or an officer of the company. Most institutions will not allow that. Most institutions allow consulting time for faculty and staff, and, or some mostly faculty. Uh, it, uh, but you can't really be a full-time uh, employee. So the best role for you as a scientist is going to be a founder uh, and chair, potentially, of the Science Advisory Board. Um, so if you're doing a startup and you decide you want to go in that direction, but you have no real business experience, my advice is don't try to, to learn on the job. Uh, go ahead and bring in an experienced business person, potentially, as a CEO of your startup. You should become the chief technology officer and uh, stick with that for a while. Next slide. So the key questions then for a scientist innovator, um, are you ready to leave academia? Um, if not, do you have a postdoc that's really familiar with the project that is passionate about it? Are they willing to jump in and, and lead that? And that would be great. Um, if, if you decide you want to leave academia and go into a startup, you really have a lot of passion for the technology. Are you willing to spend you know, 150% of your time doing that and nothing else? Um, do you have a business lead uh, or, a, or a CEO? Um, again, most investors uh, really avoid startups led by scientists, innovators. They'd like to see a business person in the lead. And then uh, I want to talk briefly about legal counsel. You need to think about three different areas. One is corporate law helping you form your company. Uh, next is transaction law. One of the first things you're going to have to do as a company is negotiate with the institution to acquire the license for the technology. And then IP law, uh, you're going to have to start working with the institution to support the intellectual property and possibly uh, develop your own uh, IP. And then finally, do you have uh, investor interest and traction? If you do, that's great. If you don't, uh, that's a bit of a problem. Next slide. So. Um, my advice is that if you're missing some of these key components for a startup, uh, licensing the correct uh, licensing the technology to an existing company might be the correct path forward. And let me just leave you with the last statement on the slide. Uh, and I always try to you know advise people uh, think about what's best for the product because that's where you put all your time and energy and do what's best for the product. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Vish. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Steve. That was a very stimulating presentation. Uh, this is a complex topic. Um, identifying a new technology is like uh, spotting a diamond in the rough, right? And really, this uh, center's process is about polishing that diamond and turning it into a truly valuable venture. Uh, but even spotting a diamond might be easier than a technology because we really don't know how to evaluate a technology that is very early stage. And I've been researching this area for many years. And Steve has really offered us a framework, a continuum along three dimensions, uh, technology status, commercial status, and intellectual property status. So that's really valuable. Um, and I see that there are a few questions here uh, that we'll uh, come to. Uh, and you know, some of you have also asked for the slides, 
and uh, I think we'll be able to share the slides with you. Steve is fine with that. He's always open and you know he, he, you know with sharing the stuff. So we're going to uh, share the slides through email based on the registrations that we have. So that part is taken care of. Um, and uh, you know also there are some people you know from Irvine who are trying to watch, but you know we're joining in late. Uh, there are questions about software. Uh, can you talk a little bit about a software recommendation system uh, which does not require all the medical steps mentioned? Uh, perhaps we can take that question because this is an interesting area where there is a convergence of information technology and the sciences, you know, like wireless IT and software and so on. Um, so where maybe the regulatory process is not as complicated. Steve, can you weigh in on that? Sure. So uh, it can be very complicated and it can be quite simple. If it's software, uh, for example, that supports some sort of a tool, it could be a research tool, uh, there's no regulatory requirements for that for the most part, and uh, you don't really have to go through those hurdles. However, it's, if it's software that's embedded behind uh, some sort of a, a device or uh, something that provides a physician with uh, with information that helps him decide what to do with the patient, uh, that's probably going to have some uh, regulatory hurdles that it's going to have to uh, deal with. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I would recommend uh, if people have questions about that, they should contact Chris Faciella at the in the Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination. Chris will be able to speak specifically to these issues uh, re with respect to the specific technology that you're you're uh, interested in. And thanks, Steve. For, you know, we are also planning a series of webinars and we could include these sort of new types of technologies at the intersection of uh, information technology and sciences as, as a future topic. Um, one other comment that was made was about the terminology. Uh, someone mentioned that the person who is licensing the technology is the licensor and the one who is licensing it away from the institution is the licensee. I think that's well taken. Maybe the terminology got a little flipped, but Steve's point is a, is a good one. The, as a professor or a postdoc or a research scientist, uh, you know, the institution owns the intellectual property. And, you know, the inventor needs to license the technology from the institution or the university. So that's the point uh, Steve was trying to make, which is a great point. It initially uh, surprises some of the scientists I've seen in our even in our university, and I'm sure you know you've seen that as well. Um, let's see. Are there any other questions that people have that they want to ask? Uh, there was a question about uh, uh, if there is no venture funding already, but you know if the technology is SBIR funded, can it qualify for funding from the CAI? Uh, Steve, do you want to comment on that? So if the technology is funded under an SBIR, SBIRs only go to established companies. So that means the technology is already in a company, and therefore that technology uh, would not qualify for a center uh, grant. Okay, I think that's a good point. So the CAI grant is a pre-SBIR type funding, and in the, the commercial status that Steve pointed out, which is, you know, we are looking for that middle stage of the cycle where an application has been uh, identified, but it is being qualified, you know. Uh, so that's the kind of technology that we are looking for, but it's not too far along that a venture has been, a company has been formed and has been SBIR funded and so on. That's a little too farther for a CAI grant. So, so one of the goals of the CAI program is to improve the ability of technologies to get into early stage companies and there, therefore improve the quality of the SBIR applications that the NIH receives. So that's one of the sort of downstream benefits that this program is anticipated to have. Right. So remember again that the you know the you know the right technology is at the intersection of these three dimensions, right? From a, a pure technology perspective, we are looking for something that is you know, sort of preclinical testing, you know, even past the basic testing and basic results in vitro, in vivo, but move its right now at a preclinical type of testing stage. And from a commercial status perspective, we have 
converge on to sort of one or few applications that are promising and we are trying to qualify them. You know, we are not in the exploratory stage of exploring lots of different applications, a platform technology with a number of applications uh, that are still being, you know, examined. That may even be a little too early stage for CAI funding. And from an intellectual property status, uh, you know, we want a technology that has not been disclosed or presented in a conference because that makes it hard to get intellectual property protection. So we want a technology that is, you know, in discussions with the University Technology Transfer Office for uh, patent filing, you know, uh, you know, provisional and beyond, you know, so that is uh, in that process. So do you want to talk something about this patent filing process, Steve, how far along it should be? So. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and I mentioned that on one of the uh, one of the slides, is as long as the technology has not been publicly disclosed, it it from an intellectual property status qualifies for the uh, for for the center's program. Um, so that what that means is that before you publish or present, you've thought about how you're going to protect the IP. You've probably initiated conversations with your tech transfer office. Uh, you're thinking about filing a disclosure. Uh, or you're, you've already gone beyond that. Uh, but if you disclose, publicly disclose your technology uh, prior to taking IP protection steps, you will not be able to commercialize the technology simply because nobody is going to invest in it because it's no longer protectable. And what that means is that other, other people, other companies that like, what, that like what you're doing are going to come and be able to copy what you're doing and potentially beat you uh, uh, to the market, if you will, uh, because of their size and, and their abilities. So it's not going to be of interest to an investor, and you're not going to be able to get uh, any kind of commercial traction with it. Right. So once again, just to reinforce, so there is a certain Goldilocks-like uh, effect here in this technology. So it, it shouldn't be too early or too late. You know, we are looking for just that right level of maturity and all these three dimensions, uh, technology maturity, uh, commercial status, as well as intellectual property. Uh, we have a few more questions. One was, can we add the email address of Chris Asiella, the expert on devices and software type issues? We will certainly do that. And there is a question here. The window is a little bit too small. As a clinical track professor, had some new idea before, during, after being hired by the university. Uh, regarding medical device that can be used to form a new device or equipment. Does this IP belong to the university? Okay, so that's a very good question. Um, my advice is that if you're going to, so if, if you've come up with the idea and you, it's then completely outside of any institutional uh, situation, what you need to do is document the fact that you've come up with the idea uh, and maybe talk to a, an IP attorney, uh, get that documented, and then when you go to work for the university, you can, many times the universities will ask you to sign a, an agreement that says, you know, any ideas you come up with uh, actually belong to the university. And so uh, they'll ask you to list anything that you've come up with prior to your joining the university, and there you'll have that to list, and you'll be able to reference the document that shows that you, that was already done. And in that case, that would belong to you uh, as opposed to the institution you're joining. Caveat to that is that if you've done that, uh, come up with that idea uh, while you're working for the prior institution uh, that may belong to the institution you were working for uh, before you changed jobs. But, uh, but it, at any rate, if it was done completely outside of an institutional situation, then it should belong to you and you should document it. Okay. Um, and then there's a question about can inventors, investigators who are primarily based at CTSI institutes other than UCLA or the other UC campuses in the BRAID network apply for the UCCAI funding? If not, please explain. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Steve can confirm this. I think the answer is no, but there are some of you here from Cleveland or Boston, and if so, you would apply through your center. And Steve, you want to add to that? Sure. So there's been three centers funded. Uh, the, the 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 UC center is uh, constitutes the uh, five medical uh, five campuses of the UC system that contain medical schools. 
Um, there is a center that's formed around the Cleveland Clinic, and there's a, uh, there's a number of institutions there that are formally part of that center. And then there's a center that's formed in Boston. And again, there are clearly defined institutions that are part of that center. If you are in one of the uh, institutions that belong to one of those three centers, you qualify for application uh, to, these, uh, to the center program. If you're in an institution that's in the neighborhood, but you're not formally a part of that center, uh, then you do not qualify. Okay, and then there is a question about what about technology that has been written about in the news without disclosing details of the innovation? Once a provisional patent has been filed, is publishing still discouraged? Ah, isn't, so, it, isn't it protected at that point? Yeah, so again, what's, what's critical is public disclosure of the key idea uh, or whatever the key piece of technical information is that, uh, you, that constitutes the intellectual property. If there's been a general press release about uh, something that doesn't disclose the key information, uh, then it's not been publicly disclosed. Uh, I have to say that you are uh, walking on a very, very uh, narrow line there. You're about to fall over the precipice. So you, uh, you, know, you have to be really careful about that. And I would recommend that you uh, consult with your tech transfer officer about those kinds of situations. And what was the other part of that question? Uh, if you published, uh, you know, if it's filed for provisional, can you then uh, disclose? That? Yes, as, as long as the filing has been uh, initiated, uh, you can do you can do publication. It's it's that's fine. Understand, and again, consult with your tech transfer officer. But understand that uh, once you do public disclosure, uh, publication, and so forth you are starting a clock that you have to adhere to in order to protect your IP. So you need to understand what that clock is and what the milestones are, and you have to get on it and be sure that you're protecting it. Okay, and then there's a comment that, I think CAI should fund earlier stage companies. One problem we have is to get help for the FDA IDE process. Can the CAI, CAI help both fund and advise? So we, we certainly can help with advice. Again, we'll provide you with Chris Sassiella's uh, email. She's uh, there, and she's deeply engaged in all of the regulatory aspects, including devices, and she can help with that. Uh, as far as funding is concerned, uh, the funding goes through the centers. Right. Um, and I believe, uh, you know, that is what we have talked about is, uh, is sort of a sweet spot for a technology assessment. And of course, if the technology is really promising uh, and if it's too early stage, it can be matured a little bit and come back for you know, uh, application again in a future year because this program is going to run for another six years. So we have some time there. Um, and there are some questions that are truly related to patents. And uh, this was not really a session on intellectual property and the fine details of it. But you know, we might ask Steve if he wants to weigh in on some of these. Uh, uh, one of them seems to be more like a comment uh, than a question. Uh, so these questions are a little harder to read in our windows. It's possible to protect U.S. patent rights with a U.S. patent application filed within 12 months of public disclosure. So the center is not interested if foreign rights are available. Um, so the, the the important point about foreign rights is that if, you're, if you think your technology is going to be attractive to a large multinational corporation uh, and you think there's a lot of value to that, if you've not taken steps to protect the, the ex-US intellectual property rights to the technology, you're going to eliminate those multi major multinational corporations. Most, uh, most companies want to be able to license the technology that can then be marketed uh, or delivered to patients around the world, not just in the US market. So by eliminating that possibility, you're, you're severely decreasing the market size for the technology, and you're actually uh, hampering your ability to attract investors and commercial uh, partners. There is a question about our inventors at LA Biomed, which is part of the UCLA CTSI. Can they apply or not? Uh, because UCCAI is not directly linked to the CTSI, but only to the UC campuses, per se. So can uh, LA Biomed apply or not? Uh, 
I, you know, I don't know if you can answer that or if we, if we need to contact uh, our experts at the UCCI at UCLA. Yeah, I'm not sure I have an answer for that, but I, I would definitely uh, reach out to the to the UC Center, and uh, there's a website, and you should be able to get to that and get an answer on that. Yes, and I think that brings us to the end of the questions. There was a question about copyrighted material, uh, whether that can be considered or not. Um, Yes, um, so intellectual property can be copyright, trademark, uh, patents, uh, you know, it's, there's a variety of things. It's a barrier to entry, something that would protect your technology uh, from being, acquired, being uh, essentially copied by somebody else. So yes, copyright is, is an important component. Right, and I think we had a few more comments uh, that are not as much questions, but to summarize, I think this Centers, Centers for Accelerated uh, Innovation Program is a novel program that looks for technologies in the sweet spot. Uh, so we have looked at these three dimensions, uh, technology status, commercial status, and IT status. Uh, and that is a little bit of a sweet spot, you know, that we need to consider. Not too early, not too late. So I, I, that's one of the key takeaway take messages for me from the session. Are there other takeaway points that you'd like to add, Steve? Uh, again, I'm just going to emphasize my last comment, which is on the slide that's uh, showing now. Uh, think about the product. If you're really passionate about the product uh, that you, you have in mind, uh, do what's best for the product. Uh, that may not be what's best for you or somebody else uh, involved, but you've got to protect the product. It is very, very difficult to get a product out to the commercial market, which is where you want it to go. So again, we intend for this program to be very data-driven. So we'd like to post those four questions. We want to revisit them. You know, uh, those questions are asked of you at the beginning of the session, and uh, we're going to show them again. Give you uh, 30 seconds to a minute on each question, um, and then uh, you'll also get a little email uh, uh, with uh, uh, you know some questions asking about the overall experience. But let's take a minute to answer these questions again. Next question, please. Question number six, yes. Question number seven. Finally, question number eight. Okay, um, I think that brings us to the end of the questions. Um, I hope you benefited from the session, enjoyed the session. If you have any feedback for us, please let us know. You're also going to get an email survey. Um, you know, as we plan this webinar series on each of the topics, we welcome your feedback, both suggestions on topics as well as the format um, as we learn how to do this on this new platform. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, once again, uh, goodbye from San Diego. Thank you, Steve, as well. Thanks, Trish.